Um, so we're back for the afternoon sessions. Um, a couple of reminders. If you're um, still interested in putting in tickets for the prize drawing, um, the last you can do that is the upcoming break in between the two talks because once the last talk begins, we'll have to gather all that stuff together to bring in for after. And the same thing is true with the um, imaging contest. Your last votes for it will be during the um, break between these two talks because those uh, results will be announced um, after the last talk. Okay? Anything else anybody wants to make a quick announcement on? Yes. Uh, could everyone who saw the sun raise your hand? Yay! <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So, isn't it nice to have an active son now after all those years? Okay, well, so let's get, get right on with our next talk. Um, we have Hank Corbett from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, Hank is a friend of our program. He's, um, he helped us install the current telescope under the dome. He was a, a volunteer host for Klein Observatory for a while um, before his, uh, his uh, graduate work kind of occupied his time a little bit more than he could drive back up here. Um, he actually graduated from Guilford College with degrees in physics and music, if I remember right. And... Um, then he's been at Chapel Hill for a few years and is about to defend, is that? Uh, almost, almost there. And so the, the project he's been involved with for a number of years is every scope and then the next step, Argus. And um, when you hear about this thing, if you don't know about it, it's, it's going to blow your mind what they're doing. And um, Hank's playing a pivotal role in how they're going to process all this information. And um, so I'm going to turn this over to him and let him tell you about an amazing project. All right. Uh, thank you, Tom. It, it's great to be here at TriStar. Uh, as you said, this is my third or I think fourth now, actually, that I've been here. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad to actually get to share some research this time. Uh, so today I'm going to be telling you about this new uh, survey instrument that we're working on at uh, just down the road at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and it's, this monstrosity here <laughs> looks a little bit like the Starship Enterprise um, cocooned in a sort of geodesic dome. Uh, but also I want to highlight some uh, recent results from the Everyscopes, which are a, a much scaled down system um, that we've been operating since 2015. That's this, this system down here in the corner. Uh, that is almost life-size, <laughs> actually. I'm realizing looking at it, that's almost exactly life-size. Um, I also want to thank uh, previous presenters from, the, from this morning's talks uh, because there's a, a trend evolving here in of time domain astronomy and the, the, the sky is uh, fundamentally dynamic. And that's hardly a new thing, but we're really entering kind of a golden age of time domain astronomy. Um, this is actually moving. If you look carefully, you can see there's some satellites and things moving across. Uh, but with the recent sort of slate of, of massively data-driven surveys, uh, things like the Rubin Observatory, it's a six meter, eight meter class telescope soon to be uh, observing the sky every three days. Um, also NASA tests looking for exoplanets and other, other surveys like ZTF, which I'll show you in just a minute. Um, we're discovering many new classes of transient and variable stars and uh, discovering examples of ones we've seen, <laughs> we, we know a lot about, um, at rates to, of thousands and thousands per year. So the majority of these, these discoveries are coming from, I'm going to say conventional surveys, um, and they're conventional and they all have roughly the same observing strategy. So they're going to look, pick out uh, predefined sort of segments of sky fields um, that they'll go back to and hit every few days, every few weeks. Um, and this, this is kind of what Eric was mentioning earlier. We, we are always looking up. Um, if your definition of always kind of corresponds to what... Uh, supernova astronomers are thinking. So every few weeks, um, there, somebody is at least looking at every part of the sky. Um, probably the most active survey right now is something called the Zwicky Transient Facility, uh, which is a, using the 48-inch telescope of Palomar, uh, but also uh, active s uh, surveys for asteroids that are also very productive for other transients, things like Atlas, it's a very wide field of view. Um, all of these are 
wide fields of view by uh, most people's standards are uh, tens of square degrees at least, so hundreds of times the full moon. So this approach to um, how, uh, how we observe the sky as, uh, is really driven by supernovae historically. Um, so you're trying to get to these, these, these fields once every few days to every few weeks. So if there's a new supernova there, you have a way to detect it. Um, so this is the field sort of visit pattern uh, for the Palomar Transient uh, Factory, which is sort of the precursor to ZTF, um, between 2009 and 2012. So this is over three years, roughly 100 epochs, 100 timestamps, 100 visits to those fields um, across the northern sky. And uh, as we move into trying to find faster speeds and finding, um, getting more time domain information about these transients, uh, there's been kind of a natural evolution to moving towards multiple telescopes. So rather than having the P48, the 48-inch Palomar telescope, you can put lots of small telescopes on a single mount and use that to sweep out a really large field of view. So projects like ASASM, the All-Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae, how's that for an ASTRO acronym, um, are going much, much faster. In fact, ASASM is covering the entire sky a thousand times a year um, to 18th mag or so, so finding most of the nearby supernovae. And they're doing this with... Um, Camera lenses. These are big Nikon camera lenses. Uh, this is a, actually a really common approach, um, not just for transient discovery, but just for general time domain astronomy when you're trying to cover um, as much, re really the metric is grasp, so volume of sky or volume of the universe observed per unit time. So these are mostly surveys that are looking for um, optical counterparts to gamma ray bursts, really energetic explosions. Um, and again, you're seeing them move to using more optical tubes <laughs> to cover the sky much more quickly. Um, so these are basically linear problems. How fast can we cover this, this section of sky with one telescope? Well, cover it twice as fast as twice as many telescopes. Um, so pi of the sky, they're covering roughly the entire sky down to, uh, oh, I don't want to give a number. I think it's 10th magnitude, something like that. Um, the prompt telescopes, the idea being you can look in multiple colors at a gamma ray burst as it's happening. Um, Razi with a similar kind of justification for trying to really quickly find um, find sources to not super tightly localized events, so gamma ray bursts, where you know it's kind of on this section of the sky, but not exactly where. Um, same argument for this is the Raptor telescope, or Raptor telescope array. Um, the caption seems to have been cut off, but that's Raptor. Um, finally, I apologize for this line drawing here. Uh, this is a telescope that was built at MIT in the mid 90s. Um, that unfortunately this is the best picture I could find of it, but the, the overall concept is very similar to every scope, um, except that they're doing it with 1990s computers in really analog fashion, so I just think it's super neat, so I like to include it. Uh, finally, in exoplanet searches, uh, there's a similar sort of demand to get denser in the time domain. So you want to be able to cover as many potential planetary host stars as you can, um, as often as you can, so you have the chance of finding a little transit where a planet's moving in front of the host star. So um, here I'll come back to, to Hat South. Uh, they're a very cool instrument. Um, but when you think about the majority of these surveys, uh, surveys like ZTF and Assassin that are tiling out the sky, uh, what you're missing is the fastest time scales. So what's happening every minute? What's happening within an hour? What's happening, like, uh, literally less than a second? So let's say you find something like this with Assassin. So this is a real data point. This is a real detection uh, vetted in two, two consecutive images of the same field. Uh, it looks like a star. And in fact, it cross-matches with a, with a star, a very specific type of star, a red, red dwarf. Uh, so there's a, we know that there's something happening on that red dwarf at that time. But there's uh, not a lot of information about exactly where you are. This is most likely something like a, a flare. So somebody mentioned a much more active sun right now. Um, really glad we're not as active as, as red dwarfs. Uh, they're much smaller stars with much more convection. Uh, whereas on the sun, a sun-like star, that's mostly happening in a pretty thin ring around the star, or pretty thin, thin band around the star. Uh, but M dwarfs and red dwarfs have much more... Um, um, active magnetic fields. So every now and then they'll get in a configuration where suddenly there has to be some way to release some energy and boom. Um, this is a small a flare from the sun, uh, but M4 flares would be very similar, just much larger. So if we want to get a more dense covering of what exactly is happening here in the time domain, uh, one approach is just to go to really extreme fields of view. 
Um, so the idea being that if you cover more of the sky in a single image, you can also cover the sky a lot faster. So if we can cover basically everything horizon to horizon in one image, uh, we can take hundreds of those images per night. So that's the approach we're taking with the Everyscopes, uh, which is this system here. Uh, so behind each one of these windows, which are, these are just optical windows, um, the, there is a Rokinon camera lens. So just an 85 millimeter DSLR camera lens. And behind that is a um, 30 megapixel cooled astronomical CCD uh, but from Finger Lakes. Uh, but together, we can get a roughly 8,000 square degree field of view that we can cover um, every two minutes with 1.4 gigapixels resolution. Uh, so there's a downside here relative to the narrower sort of tiling approach uh, where the pixels are much bigger. I mean, there's still 13 arc seconds is bigger than you would get from like an all sky cam, um, but we're absorbing a lot more background light, which means that we can't go nearly as deep as we could uh, with, with a giant telescope. But what it does do is we can take a plot like this where we found a, a here's a nice slash, and then fill in all the gaps. So here you can see not just there is a peak here, um, which we didn't, they did in fact hit right at the peak of that flare, uh, but there's also about 10 or 15 minutes of a steady rise, this interesting double peak structure, and then a steady decay. Uh, we currently are operating two of the every scope systems. There's one in the Northern Hemisphere and uh, Southern California. Um, it's just outside of, just outside of uh, San Diego. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and then we have one down in the south, in Sierra Tololo in Chile. Uh, together, they are covering about 40% of the entire sky, uh, like the entire sky, the whole, whole four pi, uh, 16,000 square degrees. So at 13 arc seconds per pixel, 1.4 gigapixels, getting down to about 15.5 in a single exposure. So compared to the larger surveys, it's not so deep, but compared to visual observing, that's, <laughs> it's pretty considerable. Um, we have been doing this since 2015 in the south and 2018, 2019, early 2019 um, in the north. And most recently we've started adding uh, the ability to, to find things in these, in these uh, images in real time. So I'll talk, come back to that in a second. But what all this, this sky coverage gets us is about 30,000 square degrees per night of sky surveying. So each individual camera covers about this field of view. So this with one, one lens. On average, about 200,000 stars in an image like that. Of course, it's going to depend on where in the sky you're pointing. But we're just going to keep zooming in here um, until you go from, from that sort of one, one camera to about 1% of that camera's field of view. Then if you go even further, you can see that we, we're really making a movie of the night sky. So this is 0.03% of the every scope field of view. And actually, I think that's the, the, a single camera, a single, uh, single, tele, single every scope field of view. Um, so we're getting this really slightly slow, every, two, every frame is two minutes, uh, view of the night sky. And you can see there's all kinds of stuff happening in here. Um, tons of satellites, which I'm glad to talk with you about if you're interested later, have uh, lots and lots of interesting satellite pictures come out of these all-sky monitors. Um, but also a nice little comet that we can watch moving relative to the background stars. So every, every scope is uh, backed by some really nice software. Um, that lets us identify any changing sources in real time. So when I say in real time, I mean we, we, every time we write an image to disk, we want to find anything that's new in that image before the next image comes in. Uh, so the way that works, as, as was mentioned this morning, is image subtraction. A slightly simplified image subtraction, where we're not using the same reference frame all the time, we're just subtracting from a previous image. So we have on this column, whatever image that we think represents the static background sky, whatever image we want to search for new sources, and then the difference. And this is, this is another really nice bright indoor flare um, that we can see was evolving for about 15 minutes. And by and large, we are actually able to get, get these images searched and the new sources cataloged uh, pretty much in real time. And we have, uh, have two science programs that I can briefly highlight <laughs> that have come out of this. Uh, one is for Earth satellites. We found just dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of satellites per minute. <laughs> um, and these are produce just fascinating patterns on the sky. Uh, most of these are not cataloged. They're just little bits of debris. Um, if you have something that's fast rotating enough and shiny enough, you can actually uh, get, get sort of second, third mag stars out of a paint fleck. Um, so here the dark spots are where there was a there was a satellite in a previous image, and it was a flash from a satellite in a previous image, 
Um, very similar to like the, if you observe like iridium flares, very similar kind of thing. Um, and then you can see that it tracks up into the next image and you get streaks coming through here. Those are probably Leosats, who knows. Um, this thing up here in the corner, that's actually a, a pine tree. <laughs> Uh, very, very common in the sky if your telescope's in the California sort of state forest and uh, lots of lots of interesting regulations about cutting trees so so we just kind of flat field that out um, the second program the second program is uh, is kind of good news it's not all it's not all science it's not all uh, satellites rather it's all science not all satellites um, so in the next uh, next few minutes I want to highlight a program we've been running um, using every scope with the 4.1 meter SOAR telescope down in Chile My, here we go. Okay. So inboard flares, like the one on the right that I showed you just a minute ago, are uh, one of the most common things we see with every scope, um, and also one of the most interesting. Uh, Indwarfs are inverse red dwarfs are very common planet hosts. They're very common in the galaxy, um, but they don't have much in the way of of UV light coming from the star itself. They're very very red stars. So most of the UV light. It's getting to, to the coming off of these stars and, the, and therefore getting to the planets is coming from these flaring episodes. Um, and the reason that's interesting, I'll, I'll go right on right headlong into the aliens talk. Um, if you want to create life, you need some you need some source to get energy from. And a lot of prebiotic chemistry does better with, with significant amounts of UV light. Uh, but you also don't want to have enough of it that you just strip away the atmosphere and sterilize the surface of the planet, uh, which can very easily happen with successive uh, flaring events. So to actually measure the UV, um, you basically have to be in space <laughs> to measure the sort of far UV that ha has these sort of really imp important impacts uh, for habitability. So a, a lot of conventional modeling, uh, you take a temperature for that flare. So you say like when, during the flare, the surface of the star got up to X temperature. Um, and then given that temperature, what does that mean about the UV flux? Uh, but that UV flux has only been measured for a handful of really active stars. So like the most active M dwarfs, things that you can take a spectrograph and go point at, point at the star, and you're just about guaranteed to get a flare. Um, so with these really low latency alerts from every scope, we started wondering, can we take flares as they happen and then go measure temperatures? Um, so the way we did this is we, we had a proposal for the SOAR, for the SOAR telescope. Um, it was a little unconventional. Um, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, time on these big telescopes is quite expensive. And normally the process is you, you have a, a target list that you submit and um, often quite detailed with here's some guide stars that we could use, here's the finding charts. Um, we took an alternate approach. We had, so we had some targets that were part of a science program, but we were also just waiting for something to happen. <laughs> and as soon as, uh, as soon as it did, as soon as we got an alert from every scope, which we get a few per night for big flares, uh, we would quickly go point the telescope at, at wherever the flare was. Um, and by quickly point the telescope at wherever the flare was, uh, this was early, mid-2020 for the first few of these. So we were taking a whiteboard, frantically scribbling some coordinates on it, and then holding it up to a webcam. <laughs> and someone in Chile was trying to read our terrible handwriting at 3 a.m. and get it into the telescope and get the whole thing pointed up. Um, and we, we actually managed to ha make this work for about six different flaring events uh, with an average latency of about 10 minutes. So about 10 minutes from when every scope said, hey, we think there's a flare here, to let's go point the telescope at it. And here is a light curve for one of those, um, one of those flaring events. So on the x-axis here is time, x-axis here is time, and on the y-axis is magnitude. So up here is, the, is when it's at its brightest. Um, so when we first detected this, it was almost 11th magnitude. So it's getting fairly bright into what you could see with most normal small telescopes. Um, but it cross-matched for the star. It was more than 20th mag. So this had gotten more than 10 magnitudes brighter in about 5 or 10 minutes. And that's like a factor of 14,000-ish in flux. Um, so we got SOAR on it about 6 minutes after the peak. And we were able to follow it for another couple of hours and saw this really fascinating structure it's actually a secondary peak there um, where the, there's a flare and then a subsequent flare. Uh, but what's really interesting here is each one of these red data points is actually a spectrum. So from each one of those spectra, we can measure uh, the temperature of the flare the same way you would measure the temperature of like a piece of metal based on its temperature. Or you have, it, you get a different black body temperature. And what we see is uh, the flare steadily cooling and then heating back up as, as you go into that secondary peak. So you're starting off way up here at like, I think, 
12 or 13,000 uh, Kelvin starting to cool down. And this is on a star that when just at complete rest is more like 2,600 Kelvin. It's a very, very late M dwarf, almost a brown dwarf kind of, kind of object. Um, and then you go into the second peak, where you get back up to about 8,000 Kelvin and then a steady cooling for a couple of hours. So anyway, that's, that's just an insight about some cool flare physics and some, some things we're doing with every scope. Um, so what do we, where do we really want to go from here? <laughs> so we've, uh, we're, if we're interested in the grasp of the system, and we're interested in finding as many of these fast um, transients as we possibly can, uh, what, what we really want to know is the volume of sky we can survey per unit time. We want to go either to wider fields of view, which is difficult because we already covered the whole sky, um, so you either need more of them, but that doesn't really probe a different parameter space because you're just seeing the same same kinds of dim things. When, uh, what we're really interested in is what we don't really know what we're going to find. Is if you're looking at second to second, is there going to be new classes of things happening? Who knows? So what this all leads us to is one of the pretty fundamental common questions in astronomy, uh, which is how can we get a bigger telescope that we can afford? <laughs> Uh, I think it's a very relatable problem uh, that most people have hit at some point or another. And uh, this is also a, a place where multi-telescope systems really shine. Um, I don't, this is just an order of magnitude estimate. I don't know anything about the financials for Mead or Celestron. Um, but what do you think the total collecting area of all the LX200s that Mead cranks out every year would be? Um, I, I don't, just rough guess, I would say it's probably the equivalent of a four or five meter telescope. And I would hazard to say that's probably a lot cheaper than building a four or five meter telescope. Uh, because there are some fundamental limits on how big you can, you can make a mirror. And how, there are only a few places in the world that can cast that and grind it and then silver it and get it somewhere. Um, so it is, it's fundamentally much, much easier to build uh, smaller telescopes. And if you build lots of them, you can build up a lot of collecting area very quickly. So right now, there's kind of a sweet spot around... 8 to 12 inch telescopes. <laughs> you may notice that there's lots of, of 8 to 12 inch um, telescopes that are reasonably priced and available. Um, so we were looking at that and we thought, how can we scale up every scope to a much bigger system? And what we ended up with is this. So this is a 5 meter class cl uh, collecting area, so about the same collecting area as SOAR, or a little bigger, um, but made entirely out of small 8 inch telescopes. Um, about 900 in total. <laughs> so, and if you combine this, each one of those with a 62 megapixel image sensor, um, these are a, a standard product that's produced by a chip that's made by Sony um, that has been kind of taking over the world. I'm sure astrophotographers are very aware of this. Um, but there's a, you can take 900 of these, build up a 55 gigapixel sensor. Um, that's an overwhelming amount of data, <laughs> obviously. Uh, we, it's something like 4.3 petabytes of data per night, uh, which we obviously can't store. It, it, later, I'll, I'll talk about how we get around that. But um, the gist of it is we can get to 16th mag a little deeper than every scope. I mean, instead of every two minutes, every second. And we can go much deeper than that, uh, basically competitive with all of the active transient surveys um, on sort of minute to hour time scales. I'm up to 24th, not, not nearly as deep as Rubin, but much faster. So this, um, when it's operating, this is a video. There we go. So while this is operating, this is, this is just a German equatorial mount. Just. <laughs> um, this system will track the sky for about 15 minutes at a time, and then it ratches back roughly covering the field of view of one telescope. So going from, it'll cover three degrees, then it'll ratchet back and then cover the next three degrees. And over the course of the night, over doing that 40 or 50 times, you can observe basically everything there is to see. Um, there is a, the reason it's shaped like a, a sort of bowl rather than a dome like every scope, um, is we very quickly realized that it could get very expensive and very fragile to have that many uh, windows in the system. So instead, we have all of the, all the telescopes look through a single window this sort of pseudo-focal point where all the fields of view of the telescope all intersect. So what this looks like kind of in, in a cutout is this is that sort of bowl of telescopes, which we call the cradle, um, that are all pointing towards a single window. It's about, I think it's about 29 inches across, give or take. Um, but you can have 900 telescopes looking through that same window. And they're all hanging from a functionally just a polar axis that tracks the sky. 
It's pointed at the pole. Um, the axis doesn't actually go through the window, but it's pointed that way. Um, this is very closely aligned with the North Celestial Pole, same as, same as any other mount. And what all this comes together to do is uh, you, you can build a very competitive transient survey out of this, out of this huge array of telescopes. So this is comparing every scope and Argus. Argus is the big red dots, every scope is down here. Um, and basically the amount of time it takes to cover the whole sky and the depth to which it can cover the whole sky. So right now, um, there's a project called Hat Pie, and it's also down in Chile, and it's doing fantastic work at sort of 5 to 15 second cadence. Um, every scope at two minutes is over here, often this weird parameter space of bright and fast things like, like stellar flares. Um, but Argus comes up and is really over here more with the transient surveys. We're going much deeper than, uh, than would typically be possible at the speeds we're hoping to go. So one, one thing to note from here is the total collecting area of Argus, even though these are just 8-inch telescopes, is about the same as all of the other surveys on this plot combined, except for Rubin, which isn't actually deployed yet, but all the other active surveys on this plot. Um, and there, there's a, a ton of science cases, a ton of things you can do with this. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details. Um, you can read them for yourselves later if you'd like. <laughs> I can send this around. Um, but it's everything to do with early time, like very early transients, supernovae as soon as they go off, uh, flares, things that are happening very quickly that, that happen and then are gone. Um, also things where normally you would have to sort of chase a field, uh, area with a, with a larger telescope. So things like gravitational wave events, if you, if you follow LIGO, um, normally they don't say, go point your telescope here, because that would be too easy. They say, go, here's sort of a region of the sky that we think it might be in. So there's a very complicated field of research of prioritizing uh, where actually in that sort of probability map that you point your telescope, uh, which for us becomes very easy because we don't actually have the ability to point the telescope. <laughs> uh, you're either seeing it or you don't. Um, so it's a, it's a very different problem, but lo lots, of, uh, lots of science you can do with this. Um, also, because we're, we're imaging every second, every 30 seconds, um, we'll have functionally a, a light curve for every single source in Gaia. So the, the astrometric catalog that was mentioned earlier. So really, we're able to uh, leverage several recent um, new technology shifts in astronomy to make this kind of thing happen. Um, and the number one thing is the availability of commercial off-the-shelf astrographic optics that are extremely fast but still wide aperture. So this is a Celestron Rasa 8. Uh, which I think, I think one of the astrophotographers was using one of these. And if you're still here, I'd love to talk with you about your experience with it. Um, but these fast astrographic optics, both from, both from Celestron and also with, from Plane Wave with the custom telescope I can tell you about, uh, the, getting just fantastic image quality, sort of micron-sized spots, um, sized stars in images with an 8-inch telescope. And the other thing is image sensors. Um, this generation of image sensors, the CMOS, um, this is not the CMOS of yesteryear with all kinds of crazy pattern noise that ruins your images. These are backside illuminated chips with 90, 90 plus percent quantum efficiency. Um, so they're extremely sensitive and extremely good at converting photons into, into electrons. Um, specifically, the Sony IMX 435 is the sensor we're using. Uh, we're using several different cameras that use it, but um, it's a it's actually a descendant, as far as I can piece together without access to sort of proprietary Sony info, um, it's a descendant of the same kind of process that they use for cell phone cameras, uh, except scaled up to much larger wafers. So you can feel like a full-size 35 millimeter camera plane. Um, the other thing that these sensors can do, in addition to just being very sensitive, is the readout noise is very, very low. So the noise penalty from reading a frame out from the camera is on the order of an electron or two. And what this means is that you can take uh, a single, like, 60-minute exposure, take 15 seconds of or 15 minutes of exposures, expose it 60 seconds, and then co-add that up to 15 minutes, so just stacking images uh, with a relatively minimal loss in depth. Um, they're also extremely fast. <laughs> in the occultations talk, um, Anne mentioned that she was using uh, QHY cameras that, that on the same sort of architecture. You can get dead times much less than a millisecond. So these are cameras that are capable of doing sort of video frame rates. So they're extremely effective at that. Um, let's see here. And the downside is if you have a 62 megapixel image, 
Um, that's about 124 megabytes. Um, and you're taking, you have 900 cameras. Each one is exposing every second. So 12 hours. So it's like you end up with, with huge amounts of data. Uh, so, and also that data is coming out of the, tele, the cameras at just unbelievable data rates. So the rate, uh, the data rate of, of images coming off of the camera, camera is something like 11 terabits per second. It was just like a bizarre unit that I didn't really have any scope or any like idea for going into this project. Um, but that's on the order of a few percent of all public IP traffic on the internet. Uh, so we can't exactly take that and transmit it to here in Chapel Hill, <laughs> um, which has led to some interesting designs for the full system. Um, the other thing I want to flag up is, I've been fidgeting with this now, I can't find it, there we go. Um, this is actually the telescope that we are using at the moment that we're focusing on. It's a design from plane wave instruments, the same people that built the CDK here at the Cloud Observatory. Um, and in fact, it, it's a very similar design to the CDK here, um, just optimized for a much wider field with slightly different correction for coma. Uh, but just on out there is an interesting thing. I tried to bring one with me this week, but unfortunately they were all in optical alignment. Oops. Okay. Um, there's another potential downside other than just the raw data rate, um, and that is maintainability. So if you have 900 telescopes, um, and one breaks every once or twice a year, or the collimation slips, or the focus goes out, is not quite right, or one of the optical elements shifts. Um, if that happens once, once a year per telescope, you now have a full-time person whose job is just to go from telescope to telescope and collimate them. Um, so that adds up very, very quickly. It can, very, can become kind of an unpleasant task to have to deal with. Um, personally, I, I enjoy collimating telescopes, but if it was all I did for years, it would probably get old fast. So a lot of the design here is centered around making everything as stable as possible. So this dome uh, actually doesn't open in any way. The telescope never sees outside air. It's everything it sees is through a window right here um, that several people have asked me about. It's just architectural glass. It's, all, it's outside of the converging beam of the telescope, so it doesn't actually have to be any better than just the atmosphere. Um, so we don't need fancy optical glass. It's kind of similar to what you put on a skyscraper. Uh, but all the telescopes look, look through that window, but they live inside of this giant temperature-controlled enclosure. So this is a system that has, has, an, has HVAC, has a dehumidifier. It's always roughly 65 degrees, and it's always 65 degrees and sunny inside. <laughs> um, part of the reason that works so well, and we don't end up with really bad seeing effects, basically, from having lots of hot air, is there's very few things inside the dome that are emitting heat. All the cameras are water cooled, and all of the cameras are uh, all the cameras are water cooled, and all that that water is piped out to radiators outside of the enclosure. Um, and that's what you're seeing over here. This is actually a data center. So to, to support that sort of data rate, you need a data center that's on site and able to, to take that, that sort of incoming data stream of four petabytes a night and convert that to something that we can actually do science with and transfer to people and share with the community. Um, so what we end up with to support that kind of data is roughly equivalent to the supercomputer we have at UNC right now, Longleaf, um, except it's going on a mountain somewhere. <laughs> So that, that's a fun, fun part of the project we're still figuring out the bugs on. Um, and speaking of bugs, uh, one of the other nice things is you don't have to worry about wildlife uh, getting up inside of your telescope nearly as much as you do with some telescopes. Uh, instead of mentioning Hat Pie again, there's this really great line in their uh, instrument paper where they're describing that, how this exoplanet search works. They're saying, the Newtonian design is prone to collecting dust and unwanted objects inside the tube and it's very laborsome to clean. So they put a, a glass window on the front. Um, and they do this because, example, black mamba snakes <laughs> are notoriously hard to remove from a telescope tube. Um, I don't think that's going to be a problem for Argus, <laughs> uh, but it's good to know we're covered. Uh, thankfully, I've been much, much luckier with, with wildlife at observatories, uh, just sort of very nice, friendly foxes from a distance. Um, so where we're actually at in implementing this is we're going through a sort of phased prototype series um, it really starts with every scope, which I've already told you about, but the, even though it looks different from Argus, the basic design of having lots of telescopes covering a huge field of view and having the data rate coming in from that and trying to process it in real time, it's all very similar. So we, we've sort of proven out this design with, with every scope. 
uh, up to a certain data threshold limit. Uh, but what we're doing now is with NS NSF support and support from Schmidt Futures, um, going through sort of a phase prototype of figuring out exactly wh where, we're, where these ideas are good and where they're not, where we, how we need to shift things around. Um, so this started 2021 with what we're calling the Argus Technology Demonstrator. Uh, this very clearly, to me at least, looks like a line between here and the pictures of, um, of Argus that I showed you, where you have a bunch of Rasa 8s on a, <coughs> on a platform, tracks the sky in sort of a dome-like fashion. Um, there's, you can see the dome behind it. We ended up not actually using a huge amount. Um, and now we're working on the Argus Array Pathfinder, uh, which is sort of the first in the series to be a meaningful science instrument in its own right. Um, this is something we deployed to uh, here in North Carolina at the Pisgah Astronomical Research Institute last December and are currently kind of in the commissioning phase trying to get all the telescopes aligned on the sky. So the uh, technology demonstrator, the major things we were trying to get a hold of are does, do these optics work reliably for us? Um, so they're all sort of F2, F3 telescopes, which if you've tried to use those, um, you know they're extremely unforgiving. <laughs> The, uh, the tilt requirements for the sensor. You have to have it within 10 microns of the focal plane. Um, the focus has to be within 20 microns and th things like that, the, the getting everything assembled and then keeping it that way can really be a bear. So it was, it was nice to have a system that we could build and have in Chapel Hill with us to test these things very quickly. Um, also, polar alignment <laughs> is a very fun process. Um, we, we experimented with trying to do it manually and trying to just wedge it in the right direction. Uh, but very quickly realized we wanted to have something motorized that we could try to automate this process a little bit. Um, so that's what's, what you're seeing here. This is just a linear actuator that does tracking, and the whole thing rotates about that axis. Uh, but these two actuators let us actually position that polar axis so that you're tracking in the right way. Um, so this is a design that we've largely carried over to the larger prototypes. Let's skip ahead. Here's the, the system again as built, and you can see those, in, those actuators for doing the polar alignment installed here. Uh, we, this is right here, it's strapped up. <laughs> it's really quite heavy. We don't, didn't want to put the load on the tracking drive while we're working with it. Um, so that system lives in Chapel Hill with us now and gets used periodically for uh, optical testing if we want to do, make sure that a telescope is aligned properly, that sort of thing. So again, the end result we're working towards, uh, which I'm, I'm showing some sort of CAD models. This is now mostly built. Um, but I'm showing the CAD models because the final result went into a shipping container. So you can't actually see anything that's inside of it very easily. It's, it's in a shipping container that's been all blacked out. So just kind of looking into a void. Um, but this is a very similar design to the full array where you have a cradle of, of telescopes that are all looking through a, a mirror, or a, mirror, a window that goes about right here and rotate about a virtual polar axis that goes about like this. And for this system, we're using, we just have the plane wave telescopes installed at this point. Um, right now, I think we have 12 of them in stock, six of which are installed at the Perry. And we're working our way through getting the alignment procedure and getting them all up there. And uh, plane wave is also still cranking them out, getting them actually, um, getting the production, production line for them going. Um, this is the system as we were installing and building it. Um, kind of a fun, fun little side project was finding a place that we could build something like this at UNC. Uh, there's not a huge amount of high base space, so we ended up getting stuck into a, an abandoned airport hangar, uh, the, the old UNC airport IGX. Um, hangar 2 was the Argus Array Lab for quite a few months. Um, thankfully, we've recently been able to put the system up at Perry in Western North Carolina. Uh, we're up on the ridge with the helipad, if, you, if you've been up there before, um, next to the, the dome with the NASA logo on it. Um, again, the system works exactly the same as the full, full array, where you have a cradle of telescopes rotating about an axis looking through a window. You can see it so very clearly <laughs> inside of this, this shipping container for us. Um, but you can't see the window. Um, you'll notice it's tilted at a very strange angle. Um, the reason for that is to avoid reflections and ghosts. Um, ghosts being the like optical term for like if you have a bounce that goes back almost where it should be, but not quite. Um, so here we have it arranged such that any reflections don't go back into the, into the focal plane of the cameras. They just go off into the side of the, tele, of the enclosure. Um, there's also another telescope back here um, called Argus Spec that is um, aimed at basically doing a similar survey to what we did with SOAR that I showed you earlier, uh, but in a much more production line kind of fashion. 
uh, actually led by this guy down here. I didn't realize he was in this photo. <laughs> we have a, a, an interloper. Um, here's a zoom in of what it looks like uh, with all the telescopes out. So this is last summer when we were putting all this together. Um, this is the actuator that moves the uh, polar axis in, in altitude. So if you're below the pole, you would extend it. If you're above the pole, you pull it back in. Um, and there's a second set of actuators that you can't see up on this beam here. Um, you also can get a sense of how cramped it is inside. It's not some, somewhere you want to necessarily be crawling around. Um, but those actuators are great for um, for letting us polar line uh, this giant. It's going to be about 18,000 pound system once all the telescopes are installed. So it's not something we necessarily want to be crawling around trying to wedge. Uh, so having an automated way to do that is really nice. Okay, so finally, um, in the final few minutes of this talk, um, I just want to quickly talk about what the data actually looks like. Uh, so we're hoping to make most of it public after we've gotten through the commissioning phase for the instrument. Um, so even at the Pathfinder scale, uh, which is this column here, we're producing a huge amount of data. And at the, at the sort of nominal one-second cadence, is the fastest cancer survey we're going to do, is taking a new exposure every second. Um, we're producing roughly the same data rate as the full array will produce at 30 second cadence. So we're, with, with Pathfinder, we can test not just the sort of basic instrument design ideas, but also how well do our pipelines, how well can our software cope um, with, with producing this data in real time. So the basic idea of how it works, how we manage to keep all the data, um, is that we don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you keep just what's interesting and everything else goes away. Um, and the real finesse there is figuring out what interesting means and how to identify that very quickly. Um, so we have images coming in from the cameras. Uh, we spent a lot of time getting really optimized interfaces for Attic and QHY cameras. Um, if you want to control Attic and QHY cameras from Python, if that sounds interesting, please come find me. I'm glad to talk your ear off about it. Um, the images come in and go into an image calibration system where you have a custom astrometric solver where you can find uh, the, uh, basically a mapping between the pixels in that image and sky positions in about 90 milliseconds, which is uh, relatively fast as these things go. Um, you're, we're, we're trying to get this such that it can run at the one second cadence, uh, which means that even things like the time it takes to copy a, an image to disk or even copy it from RAM to the CPU and back again, uh, really start to matter. So uh, one thing we ultimately ended up doing is moving most of the, the most intensive compute steps, um, things like actually identifying stars in the image, <laughs> very basic stuff like that, onto GPUs, so like the same kind of uh, add-on cards you'd use to play video games on your computer. Uh, because they're very, very good at doing simple math extremely quickly, um, especially if you want to do the same math to lots and lots of uh, data like you would in an astronomical image. So finally, um, here's an image. Uh, I think this is actually from the tech demonstrator, not from Pathfinder, but need to get some Pathfinder images in here. Um, so we start with an image like this. We do the astrometry. We locate it on the sky. Um, but then we, we break it up into little chunks like this. So the image actually gets stored and analyzed in these little squares uh, that map their equal area on the sky. So if you download an every scope image, uh, what, or every scope image, an Argus image, what you'll get is a stack of, of, of triangles like this. They're actually squares, but the, the footprint on the sky is that kind of quadrilateral. And for each one of those, you find all the pixels that have stars in them. Um, this includes both like catalog stars that we know are there, and also things that we find in real time. And you keep those those uh, pixels. Everything else gets set to zero. So, and the the advantage to that is that with all of those zeros, you can compress the image very, very efficiently. So what you end up with is instead of having to store 124, 122 megabytes, 124 megabytes actually, I think, um, you can get like a 95% reduction in the actual storage space you need. So this is still not enough for one second cadence, but at uh, 30, second, or 30 second cadence, every 30 second exposures totally can store that per night. Um, also, just to say that we have something for everything, uh, we will also have a basically every scope resolution images of the whole night sky out of Argus. Um, finally, I'm going to leave us with a nice little co-edition image here. Um, so because, again, that sort of read noise thing where you don't have a, a penalty to taking lots and lots of exposures and combining them in software, uh, we can combine the images. These are from Chapel Hill, beginning to 1980. Um, so you can combine these images fairly 
fairly harmlessly. Um, all right, so finally, I just want to leave up this little slide about data access. We're hoping to make everything public, uh, particularly for for the full array, but also for Pathfinder after we've gotten through commissioning. Um, so if you have anything you want to do with every with Argus data or every scope data, um, feel free to just let me know. And uh, at that, I think we have a few minutes for questions. And um, thanks. All right, Eric, I saw you first. It, say you found something super, super interesting. Yeah. Any capability to keep the, the highest resolution? <coughs> yes. Uh, yeah. If we find something super, super interesting, um, like if we see a some uh, something that's fifty times brighter, or we see something that we think is probably a supernova, um, those pixels go into the mask that gets saved. Um, so if you go back to this image, um, those stars are not just like catalog stars; those are also image subtraction results. Uh, there's a, there's a bunch of betting systems in there that we can talk about offline if you want, but. Oh, you mean uh, from, is it season four, episode 12 of Star Trek The Next Generation? <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. I like your telescope. How much does it cost? Uh, great question. Uh, how much you got? No. It's, a, it's about $18 million. How much? $18 million. $18 million. Yes. Does that include the final installation and operation? So we think we can get it built and installed, um, depending on the site, uh, for about 18 to $20 million. Uh, right now we're funded uh, through the NSF to develop a prototype. Um, so we're up to the 38 telescope. We're in the process of seeking funding for the full array. Um, but that's, that's still the ongoing process. Yeah, you got to follow up? Well, your next generation is going to use a larger scope, a larger RASA, right? Are you looking at the 11 inch? Yeah, so. How many of those, and what are those costs? Sure. So, the, if you go to the 11 inch, you're. Um, oh, I should know these numbers on the top of my head. I think it's 1,400 RASA 11s you would need. Um, there's a project, there's several projects actually that are using RASA 11s. Um, I think as, uh, Atlas, the, the asteroid survey that finds a lot of supernovae, has a project based on that. Um, we're pretty much stuck, or I say stuck, we're pretty much pretty much selected the, the plane wave um, telescope for the full array. Uh, we, we've been really happy with the optical quality um, and the ability to get them stable. Uh, they're very similar to the Delta Rho uh, 14s, if you've seen those. I think they're available as a commercial product. Um, these are smaller, these are 8-inch. Does that answer your question? Leads to a few others. That's fine. We, we can talk about it more. <laughs> also, I, I'm, I'm sure I've been supposed to say the questions out loud. Um, he was asking about the telescopes we use and which, uh, which models and why. Um, any other questions? How wide is the window? So, for weirdly, it's actually about the same whether you have 38 telescopes or 900. It's about three feet across uh, because they all converge about the same. Can you repeat that? Yeah, so the question was, how big is the window that they're all looking through? Um, and the window is, is, funny enough, actually about the same size, whether you're looking at the, the Pathfinder prototype system or the 900 telescope full array. And it's about three feet across. Um, it's not a huge window. Yes, sir. So we have, um, we've experimented with the QHY 600s. Um, we used those for the first sort of tech, tech demonstrator model. Uh, we ended up going with the Attic APX 60s, uh, which are, it's actually a custom version of that that has water cooling built in. Uh, I think they also have a new camera based on the same chip that's slightly different. I haven't actually talked to them about it yet, but need to. Yeah, question was, what, what cameras are we using? When you get away from the lecture, we're not hearing you. Oh, really? Oh, interesting, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll just stand here. Um, so the question was, what cameras were we using? And the answer was, uh, we're using uh, Attic APX 60s and QHY 600s. Mostly, we're using the Attics uh, because they their custom model that has water cooling. All right. Uh, any other questions? And similarly, if I'm here, I can't actually see you all that great because of glare on my glasses. So. <laughs> Yes. Um, 
So um, from, wh from, which, from which star? <laughs> for, the, for the big flare? Um, so the, the big flare that is in here... So this is, a, this is actually a very nearby star. Um, so this would have been on the order of tens of years, I think. Um, I don't actually know that number off the top of my head, but um, it'd, be, it'd be on the order of tens of years. Do you know what star that is? Um, I can give you the two mass like phone number for it, but it, it's a the magnitude is twenty point seven in G band, so it's not one you would just like know off the top of your head probably. Um, nobody else did, <laughs> uh, but it got ten magnitudes brighter. So very briefly, it was it was a prominent star, but. Yeah, can, can you address how are all the transient, I mean, stuff like Starlink and mm -hmm. so on, is that going to be a real big problem for you? Or are you going yes. to have enough um, computing power to, to just knock out satellite transients? So I have a whole bunch of slides about this. This, this is a, another research project I've been working on for a few years. Um, it's kind of looking for, looking at satellite impacts on, on our telescopes and others. Um, the short answer is that Starlink is not that huge of a deal for us um, because we're taking so many images that um, really we're not that attached to any one of them. Uh, mo most of the, uh, the objections you hear with the astronomy impacts on, uh, on, from, from Starlink come from uh, largely from the Rubin Observatory uh, because they are so exquisitely sensitive. Um, their, their camera is just an amazing piece of engineering and technology that that having just a bright streak anywhere in the, in the sensor can completely wreck their science. Um, that's not a problem we have. We're actually pretty carefully scoped away from doing really high precision photometry, uh, measuring brightnesses very, very precisely. Uh, we tried that with every scope, and it, it was, it's, it's certainly something we could do with Argus, but it's not, not something that any of the science cases our lab is specifically trying to do require. Um, so yes, it's, it's a problem, um, but the things that really are kind of a, an issue for Argus our satellite glints. So instead of having a, a continuous streak, you just have like a single flash where you just have a, a satellite that you can't see, but it just happens to rotate in a way that catches sunlight and you see it for just a fraction of a second. Uh, we see just thousands of these a night with every scope. And um, talking with the community and passing around some numbers, this seems to be get exponentially worse as you get di di uh, to dimmer stars or to dimmer limits. The real issue is they all look like transients. <laughs> they look just like every scope PSFs because they're, they're happening for such a short time that the streaking isn't visible. All right. All right. Uh, anything else? Or? All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You all have a great day.